All right, tonight, rejoicing produces strength. I want to talk about strength coming off of our message from last week. Last week, we talked about how uh, the springs of refreshing, and we celebrated, and we were uh, opening up that uh, well of joy, and we, and we danced around, and we rejoiced, and we talked about that we need to pivot as the body. We were talking about how uh, the, the, the actual scripture in there means to turn. Um, and so, so uh, I'm sorry, when... Peter was speaking about in Acts 3, um, yes, let me go to my notes so I know what I'm talking about. How about that? That would help. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. And this is in Acts 3.19. And we talked about that, how, how the, to, to pivot or to turn away and, to, and move back towards the Lord. So we were looking at that, and this week we're going to talk about the other side of that, and that is the strength part, how, re, how repentance produces rejoicing and rejoicing produces strength. So Acts 3.19 again, therefore repent and turn, and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and so that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus. Therefore repent, Peter says. So again, repenting produces rejoicing, and rejoicing produces strength. Sometimes repentance produces tears, and it's a good thing. Psalms 126.5 says, Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. They may weep as they go out carrying their seed to sow, but they will return with joyful laughter and shouting with gladness. Anybody glad? As they bring back, this will make you shout, armloads of blessings and harvest overflowing. Can somebody say it's harvest season? Listen, Truthfully, we are entering into harvest season in the natural, right? So September, October, this is, this is harvest season that we're entering in. So the, the, uh, the September, when we go through the feast the new, the, in the Jewish New Year, and then we go into the Feast of Tabernacle, we have Yom Kippur. And so we enter into this harvest season. So what are we harvesting? What exactly are we harvesting? Well, one of the things that we're harvesting is joy and strength. So we're moving into, we should be moving into joy and strength. So one way that we harvest joy and strength is one through repentance, right? So we can, we can be joyful through repentance. So listen, repentance, it sounds like a bad word, like you did something wrong. Well, sometimes we do th- do things wrong. As far as I'm concerned, if I drive down the, the interstate or dr- get in my car, it's not too long that I'm in my car where I'm like, mm, I might have to repent for that. <laughs> See, because sometimes people do things that involves you in- indirectly. Sometimes people cut me off and, you know, and I have to remember that I have breakthrough church on the back of my car and that also I'm a pastor. So I can't, I can't, you know, get up next to them and let them know that they cut me off like I sometimes I want to. So people can irritate you just being transparent. I'm sure that, you know, we all, you know, transparent pastor. I'm sorry. So, but repentance should bring joy. So in other words, when we, when we pour our heart out before God, when we, you know, one of the things we looked at last week, we talked about it is when uh, in the Feast of Tabernacles, they would have this ceremony, they would actually pour out water. So they, they were dumping out water. So one of the things that we want to do is pour ourselves out before the Lord. So when we pour ourselves out before God, and sometimes that's through repentance, sometimes I have to get alone with God and I have to allow whatever's in me to be poured out. I have to dump it out. You know, one of the things in journaling is very good because in, in um, the world of, uh, what's it, counseling, they say one of the terms that they use for uh, journaling, they say it's called emotional puking. So uh, you emotionally are pouring yourself out on the paper. You're getting that stuff out. So, so there's nothing wrong with pouring yourself out before God. Are you all with me? Are you all here? All right. Two people agree that you have to pour yourself out before God. Three. So in Acts chapter 3, we were just talking about the scripture. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what happened. So, so Peter and John are on their way to, or James and John are on their way. Peter and John, I'm sorry. I have so many people going through my mind. They're on their way to the temple. It's 3 p.m. They're going there. That Every day they would do this. They're going to pray, and they see the guy at the gate, beautiful, and he's begging for money, and obviously they're like, we don't have any money, but what we do have, we'll give to you freely. We will freely give it to you, what we do have. So he reaches out his right hand, and he says, in the name of Jesus, get up. So what happens? The man jumps up on his feet, and he starts rejoicing and is excited. It says that in verse 7, Acts 3, 7, it says that immediately... 
His feet and, and ankles were strengthened, and leaping up, he stood up and began the walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Why? Because healing was coming forth. What was it doing? It was, it was producing joy in him. Now, I mean, if you could not walk, and then suddenly you were jumping up on your feet, I think you would have a little bit of joy. You would be a little bit excited, I think. See, immediately it says he was strengthened. So again, healing, one of, the, one of the things that produces joy and strength in our lives is healing. God likes to heal. Why does God heal? Well, some reasons for healing is, is for salvation. Because as we read the rest of this chapter, when this happens, everybody starts gathering around. And they know this man has been here for a long time. And so everybody's gathering around to see what happened. And, and so then they begin to preach. And they begin to tell him, and they give him a little history lesson about what happened. And he says, listen, Jesus, whom you crucified and let Barabbas, the murderer, go free, is, a, is the one that healed him. We didn't heal him, but Jesus healed him. And then he gives him a more history lesson going through the prophets and telling, explaining to them everything that happens and what happens. Thousands of people get saved as a result of the man getting healed. See, your joy, your peace, your strength, your gladness is a sign to those around you. It is a testimony. It's a testimony. If you're walking around always with your head down and always weighted down, how is that a testimony as a believer? How does your light shine? Listen, the enemy wants to come, and like Elena was talking about, he wants to come and put a basket over your light. He wants, to put a, he wants to cover you up so that your light doesn't shine. How does he do that? But by loading burdens upon you, by putting things on you, by getting you to think a certain way about thinking about your problems, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and this is happening, and that is happening. Well, what happens eventually is what? You start to be bent over. You're carrying this weight. And so Jesus never, he never intended you to carry those things because one of the things that Jesus did when he came is he broke off burdens and destroyed yokes that were around us. The anointing destroys burdens, yes? The anointing of Jesus Christ destroys burdens. It removes yokes. There's no reason why you need to be shackled. There's no reason why you need to be carrying those things because Jesus, the anointed one, came to break that stuff off of you. Are you all here tonight? Listen, when you walk in the church, when the anointing is here, when the presence of God, if the presence is here, the anointing is here. The anointing does that. The anointing will anoint you. Listen, somebody say, I'm slippery. I'm slippery. Listen, if you're anointed, you're anointed. There's no reason why the enemy should be grabbed the whole of you. Remember when I talked about, I was, none of you believe this, but when I was talking about the watermelon, you know, I none of anybody else played this because I was the only one. But, you know, you... you you would go to these picnics and you used to have to, you know, grab the watermelon and we would grease it up so you couldn't hang on to it. And you had to try and move it from one, it was like football. And, you know, every time you picked it up, you were like, you know, doing this and you couldn't hang on to it. And that's what happens when the, en the enemy comes at you when you're anointed. The anointing is to make you get through tight places so that you can keep moving on. Exodus 15, 2 says, The joy of the Lord is my strength and song. Somebody say, The joy of the Lord, the of the Lord is, my is my strength and song. See, there's another type of strength. So we looked at strength that comes from healing. God strengthens our bodies. There's another type of strength. In Nehemiah chapter 8, the governor Nehemiah has Ezra the priest reading the law. They just get done building the temple and the restoring the walls and hanging the doors and all that. And so the reading of the law comes forth. And, it, and generally when the law was read, they would be weeping because it was reminding them of their national sins. But I don't believe that was the case here. I believe because of the situation that was happening and they were reading the law for the first time for many, many, many years, the people hearing the words of the Lord began to weep. Now, did it convict them? Possibly, probably. But I believe they were weeping because they were hearing the word of God being spoken over them. See, it says in Nehemiah 8.10, Nehemiah declares, This is a sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected or sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, the strength Nehemiah is talking about here is, actually means a protective fortress. So strength here means protective fortress. It is the Hebrew word ma'uz. Somebody say ma'uz. A place of means of safety, protection, refuge, a stronghold. 
2 Samuel 22, 2 said, David said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Psalm 91, 2 says, I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. See, literally the translation here means, it means to delight in Jehovah is a refuge and a strong tower, a strength, a refuge of strength. Delight in Jehovah is a refuge of strength. That's literally what uh, Nehemiah 8, 10 would translate to. So, what is inside this protective fortress? I'm glad that you asked. Well, one, we know that repentance or turning back to God because repentance produces what? Joy or rejoicing. And rejoicing produces strength. Strength. Somebody's listening. All right. There's a test at the end, so you got to make sure you pay attention. So, a few ways to look at this scripture. Number one is that God takes pleasure or delights in his people. God takes pleasure and delights in his people. Or you could look at it this way. We delight in God. Another way would be when we gather together, we form a refuge, a place of strength. Strength comes from gathering. Forsake not the assembling of the saints. Why? Because He's in the midst of us. Jesus said, wherever there are two or more of you gathering together, there I am in the midst of you. See, Leviticus 26, 8 says, five of you will pursue a hundred, and a hundred of you will pursue 10,000, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. Joshua 23, 10 says, each one of you will put to flight a thousand of the enemy, for the Lord your God fights for you just as he has promised. See, there is strength in gathering. Are you glad that when we gather together, the enemy has to flee? See, it says when he comes in one way, he'll, he'll be going out several different ways. See, aren't you glad that you know when you get together two or three or more, and there's more than two or three here, aren't you glad when we come together and we praise and we worship that it sends the enemy out in multiple different directions in the, by the thousands? Are you glad that our praise, are you glad that your praise, are you glad that you, when you open your mouth, can send the enemy fleeing in several different directions? Are you happy about that? Are you glad? Come on. See, that produces a stronghold, a fortress. We're driving out the enemy, driving him back. That is part of the purpose of the kingdom is to drive out the enemy. When God's kingdom comes, it drives out the enemy. There is no struggle for who's going to take over this part of the territory or that part of the territory. There's no challenge. There's no, nothing. When the kingdom comes, the enemy has to move. He has to move. Somebody say, he has to move. So what will I find when I gather, when we gather together? What do we find when we gather together? Well, one is healing, provision, restoration, joy, gladness, the fruit of the Spirit, safety and shelter, communion, fellowship, family, protection, deliverance, new beginnings, and favor, just to name a few. You see, but the enemy has another plan. The enemy would like to bring strife and division and discord and dissension. The Bible says in, in uh, Ephesians 4, don't give place to the devil. Don't give him room. Don't give him place. Love your neighbor as yourself. I believe somebody said that in the Bible. Jesus said to love one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, Daniel, this is in there, I added it. It says, I plead with you, this is starting in verse 1, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank given to you in your divine calling. So somebody say, I have a rank. With tender humility and quiet patience. I know that's hard for some to be quiet and patience. Always demonstrate, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another. Especially, somebody say especially, especially. toward those, come on, say it, who may, who may try, your try your patience. Oh my gosh, what did he just say? 
You mean I have to actually love somebody that is trying my patience? That's like sandpaper against me that I have to rub elbows with. And I'm like, why did you touch me? What's their problem? Why are they coming at me like that? You know, one of the things that makes you more like Jesus is to have to love somebody that girts you in the wrong way. Mm. Having church tonight. Be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Spirit among you in the bonds of peace. Somebody say peace. peace. Be one body, one spirit, as you were called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. I'm going to say this again just so you get it. As you were all called, all of us are called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. In other words, let me break it down to you a little more simpler than that. Say, so you need to stop thinking yourself better than what you think you are. You think, you can't be like, well, I'm better than that because, you know, because I have a, I have a destiny and calling in my life. So does everybody else. Don't think yourself more highly than you think you should. I believe this is in the Bible as well. Don't position yourself so lofty and think you're so amazing that you can't minister to the person that's hurting in a need. I'm just preaching the word. Why? Because it causes division. The enemy will love nothing more than to come in and destroy the beautiful atmosphere of the presence of God. Listen, we, God is a builder. Look, what does Jesus do? He does what? What does Jesus do? He gathers. Everybody say gather. 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 Jesus gathers. He never scatters. Jesus gathers. He never scatters. Jesus gathers. He never, what does the enemy do? He wants you to scatter. Strike the shepherd, scatter the flock. That's the enemy. The enemy will love nothing more than to cause division and break apart what God is trying to build. See why? Why does the enemy not want us to build something? Why? Because it's powerful. So another type of strength is called as might and power. The Hebrew word owes. Somebody say owes. O-Z-E. It means boldness, loud. I know there's some loud people in here. Might, power, strength, and strong. The root word, the root meaning of ooze is to actually know or see a weapon. Know or see a weapon. Somebody say, I know a weapon. Know a weapon. Now look at somebody around you and say, it's you. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10.4, for the weapons that's speaking of you, of our warfare are not fleshly but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What fortresses are those? The enemies, right? It's talking about things being built up in our mind as well. Listen, don't let the enemy build a case against yourself. I'm going to say it again. Don't let the enemy build a case against yourself. That's his job. You know, I talked about this before. One of the, one of the, one of the, um, uh, one of the, What's the word I'm looking for? It, words of the enemy or description, um, there it is. Descriptions of the enemy is that he is a, a prosecuting attorney in the court of law. When it says that the, the enemy goes about roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, when it talks about the enemy there, that word enemy, it actually means prosecuting attorney. That word, that's what he's doing. He is trying to build a case against you, to, to build a case against you, to destroy you. That is his job. But thank God we have another that comes alongside of us that acts as our mediator. His name is Holy Spirit. Can somebody say Holy Spirit? Somebody that was given to us that comes in and says, nope. Then we have Jesus as well. That's going, nope. Aren't you glad that you have Jesus and the Holy Spirit that's on your side? So one of the Greek words that are equivalent to oz, the Hebrew word oz, is dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. That means strength, power, ability. It is inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue, the virtue of God. Power of performing miracles. Aren't you glad that we are able to perform miracles? Moral power of excellence of soul. Matthew 16, 13, or 6, 13 uses it like this. It says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And Luke 4, 14, after the temptation in the wilderness, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. 
In Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the what? Power that works in us. Everybody say the power that works in me. See, dunamis, dunamis also means power consisting in or resting on armies, forces, and hosts. You're going to love this one. Hebrews 11.34, although weak, talking about all of the heroes of faith, says, although weak, their faith imparted power to make them strong. Aren't you glad that the mustard seed of faith imparted to you can make you strong? See, faith sparked courage within them, and they became mighty warriors in battle. Are you glad that faith can spark something in you called courage that cause you to stand up and be a mighty warrior? Yes. Listen, we need mighty warriors right now in the kingdom. We need mighty warriors in the church. We need a spark of faith to ignite believers in the church to stand up and say no to some things, right? We need, a, we need a, a move of God, a reformation to come in and for that spirit and that power to be released again. Listen, the dunamis of God is the Holy Spirit. You have to have Holy Spirit. You cannot move in the power without him. So faith sparked courage within them and they became mighty warriors. What? To do what? Pulling armies, that's angelic warriors, from another realm into battle array. What this actually means is that their faith was so strong that when they prayed and they started moving, that it was pulling the armies of heaven, the armies of heaven, into battle formation, getting ready to do battle with them. Aren't you glad? I mean, I don't know, this excites me because I know what I'm praying and I'm getting excited and I start to do warfare and I start declaring the word and I start praising and I start moving and I start playing on my guitar even though it might be a wrong note. I know that when I start speaking, what am I doing? I'm drawing angels in that are forming in battle position to fight with me. Aren't you glad that angels come alongside of us to fight? They just don't stand there and, make, and say you look nice. I mean, they're used more for parking spaces than what you should wear. <laughs> See, we are weapons of power in God's hand to destroy enemy fortresses. Yes. Somebody say, I am strong, I am strong. In, the in the Lord. Say it again, I am strong, I am strong. In, the Lord. in the Lord. Travis, you can come back. Ephesians 6, 10, 6, 10 says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This, this power means explosive power. This is the word and dynamo. Somebody say in dynamo. It is to be strong and do with strength, to receive strength, to increase strength. So see, not only do you have strength that comes on you, there's strength in you that rises up. See, there's anointing that the Holy Spirit can come on you and he's in you. The Holy Spirit comes on you and he's in you. For what? To strengthen you. It should, the Holy Spirit should cause you to stand up and rise up and be strong in the Lord, to be strong in power, to be strong in what, what you believe in. I'm going to read it like this, and this is out of the Passion Translation. Now, beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Aren't you glad Paul saved that for last? Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force, the force, reminds me of Star Wars, of his explosive power flowing in and through you, explosive power flowing through you. See, let's use this explosive power to build the kingdom. Let's not allow the enemy to use it to destroy each other. Amen? That's what we want to so I want, would you all stand with me? We're going to repeat some things. Here we go. We're going to repeat this. So I am strong in the Lord. I, am strong in the Lord. I have been infused with Christ's explosive life, conquering life, altering power. His anointing destroys yokes and removes burdens. I am anointed by the Holy One who destroys yokes and removes burdens. Therefore, I am infused with Christ's explosive power and have been anointed 
to destroy yokes and, and remove burdens. And We're going to read that again. Therefore, Therefore, and say it like you mean it, I am infused, I am infused with Christ's explosive power, with Christ's explosive power and, have and have been anointed to destroy yokes and, and remove burdens. And remove burdens. Amen. Amen. All right.